My name is Furman Fordham. I am the senior pastor of Riverside here in Nashville. And we want to welcome you to our Riverside family and to our ministry. We are so happy that you have tuned in. Our prayer is that you will come to know God, grow in God, and sow God's love. We are praying that this presentation will be a blessing to you. And if you are ever in Nashville, we invite you to come worship with us. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Everything I have, I believe that God will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. Uh, I will admit and testify to you that I struggle walking in that belief. You know, as soon as life throws something at me that makes me uncomfortable, I question whether he will supply. And I question whether he is good, and I question whether he even has me on his mind. So I profess what, with my mouth what my body struggles to walk in, what my flesh rebels against, and, and that is the tough part about Christianity. Paul says it this way, the stuff I want to do, I don't do those things. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing those things. So he says, there are two natures at war within my body. One that will lead me to righteousness and the other that will lead me to death. That is our plight. And I believe on a day like this where we're kind of changing things around, it could be the temptation of the flesh to rise up in someone and start pointing to them all the things that are changing uh, all the things that are left out the service on a soul Sabbath, all the reasons why, man, I kind of just want church to go on like it usually goes on. You know? This is my time to woo sigh and kind of relax and push away from the world. I enjoy that time. And hey, why do we have to do soul Sabbath? Why do we have to do it? I'm a youth pastor, so one of the things that you have to be proficient in as a youth minister is answering the question, why? Because you could stand up before a group of young people, man, Jesus died for you. Why? Good question, good question. Um, you should keep the Ten Commandments. Hand raises, why? It's so important to answer the question why, and I believe God wants to do that today. Why are we dressed down? Why are we trying to get out of church earlier and why is it that we have these so Sabbaths? Yeah, God wants to answer those questions, and I want you to look with me at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. We're going to, with the help of the Holy Spirit, try to empower your spiritual man to conquer your fleshly man and get excited about this thing we call sowing. Luke chapter 10. We're going to read a little bit. Uh, we're going to read an entire parable story there, starting with verse 25. We're reading from the New Living Translation. Our visual team should have it for you there. Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. Because of the length of this passage, I actually want you to remain seated as long as you promise to still pay attention. All right? Still pay attention. Uh, so focus in, key in, and if you can see it either with you or on the screen, say, uh-oh. It reads, verse 25, one day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? What he's really asking right there is, what do I need to do to go to heaven? Will we all agree on that? Amen? Okay. What should I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Man, that's a great answer. Verse 28, Jesus affirms that answer and says, right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions. Now, what it's saying here is he stood up to look smart in front of everybody. 
But now it's looking as if his comments and his questions are average. Because Jesus just says, yeah, you're right. Good job. You want a cookie? One of those things. And so now the Bible says to justify his actions, to make everybody th see that he's actually a deep brother, that he actually has some knowledge that's above average. To justify his actions, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? That's when the whole audience says, oh. Yeah, verse 30, Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there. But he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Verse 34, going over to him, the Samaritan sued his wounds with all olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. Verse 35, the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. I want you to repeat after me. Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Verse 36. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. Verse 37. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes. Now go and do the same. Yeah, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I just want to speak under the theme, how to get to heaven. How to get to heaven. God, may everything that you showed me happen in this place, I believe. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so check this out. I didn't do it on purpose, and I do believe in honoring the Sabbath by trying to stay away from secular activities that may and possibly will take my mind away from what this whole day is all about. And so uh, I did roll over, though, picked up my smartphone to just kind of look at any text messages or emails that had come in while I slept. And notice this news flash that came across one of my widget apps. And it simply said, LeBron is no longer going to sign with Cleveland. Now, I have this issue because it's the Sabbath, right? And I'm like, wait a second. We just celebrated this thing all last, last yesterday. For the past 15 hours, we've been celebrating it. Why is it that LeBron is not going back to Cleveland? Now, as you guys heard this, I heard a gasp in the audience, correct? A gasp, like, what in the world is going on? Is Jesus coming soon? He must be coming tomorrow. This is just major news, right? Okay, so what I just told you was a fictional story. A fictional story that caused you to gasp. What I need all of us to understand... <laughs> see, I'm, gonna, I'm going to show you how God meets you where you are and brings you where he wants you to be. Amen. You gasp. What a lot of people don't recognize about this story of the Good Samaritan is when Jesus tells it, the whole audience gasps. See, we read it and think it's a pretty cool story with an awesome moral, but it doesn't cause any of us to kind of step back and reconsider our entire world view. I mean, when I say LeBron is no longer going to sign with Cleveland, it disrupted your whole thought process. It was, it was as if something in your world had changed dramatically, and it caused you to step back. Some of you started fighting the temptation to pull out your phones right now, and in the middle of the sermon, look up whether I read some type of spoof or if it was actually legit reported by ESPN or Sports Illustrated. It was the same thing when Jesus told this story. Here's the reason, because when he uses the Samaritan as a hero... That causes a gasp. Here is why. Samaritans, many of us think, were just simply outcasts. People that the Jews kind of put to the side, played to the left. But I want you to know that it was way deeper than that. 
Samaritans were actually enemies of the Jews. Their distaste and hatred for each other was so great that it was very common for a Jew and a Samaritan to come across each other and it immediately lead to fisticuffs. Immediately. I'm talking about they hated each other so badly that it could only be compared to some modern day gang wars that we see being waged in cities like Chicago and Detroit where homicide numbers are just through the roof every weekend. But the news doesn't tell us about that stuff because it's simply minority men killing other minority men. It was to that level of heated animosity in the face of the fact that no, this is my territory. See, the Samaritans were mixed breeds when the Assyrians conquered the ten tribes of Israel to the north. What happened was they took most of the Israelites away from their country. And they moved the Assyrians into the country with one assignment. We need you to sleep with as many women as possible and create a new race to where this Israelite race actually ceases to exist in this region. So the Assyrians intermingled with the Israelite women that they left there. They took the men away so the men couldn't save and protect the women. Sounds kind of like what the enemy is doing to us today. Trying to take the men away so that he can create a mixed breed by taking advantage of our women and our children. This is what the Assyrians did. So they come onto the scene. They start having babies. But these babies no longer have this pure blood. And this plan was so successful that they created a brand new race in the region called Samaritans from the territory of Samaria. This is why the woman at the well looks at Jesus when he first comes to talk to her. First thing she says is, what is a Jew doing talking to a Samaritan? So when Jesus is telling this story to the masses... He's using an enemy as the hero. And just like all of you did here today, when he gets to the point of the story, when a Samaritan helps a Jew, everyone gasps. But here's where the problem is with the story. Notice that at the end of the story, Jesus goes back to the man who asked him a question at the beginning. This is very important for us to understand this story. This man asks, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? So this story is just not simply about helping your neighbor. The story is told as a response to a very specific question. How do I get to heaven? And this story holds a secret. Now watch this. If you look at the end of the story... The man who asked the question is so appalled by the story that Jesus just told that when Jesus says, now which one of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? This is verse 36 in Luke chapter 10. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. He hates Samaritans so much, he won't even form the word Samaritan. Come on, let's read this as human beings. If someone tells you a story and asks you a question about the characters, you will respond to that question with the name of the character in the story. You will say the tortoise, or you will say the hare. You will say Little Red Riding Hood. I mean, you are Robin Hood. You will say any of the names of the characters mentioned in the story. But this man is so appalled, and he is so distant, he is so disgusted that Jesus Jesus would use this reject from Samaria as the hero in his story. That all he can manage to say is, it was the one who helped this man. Why is this lawyer so angry at Jesus' story that he won't even admit the fact that it was a Samaritan that is the hero? I'll tell you why. The question is, how do you get into eternal life? That is so important because then Jesus says, which one of these three 
is this man's neighbor. Now, the man just said before, when Jesus said, hey, what, what does the Bible say about getting into heaven? This guy drops the theological bomb, love God, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you're right, do these things and you will live. Then the guy tries to get smart and say, well, who then is my neighbor? So when Jesus says, out of these things, Three, which one was this man's neighbor? What he's really trying to get the audience to accept is, out of these three, which one goes to heaven? He's expecting his listeners to accept the fact that in the story that starts with a priest, the highest spiritual order in the land, if there's anyone that's going to get to heaven, it's going to be the priest. And then it goes to a Levite, which is a temple worker, which is an individual that is still highly esteemed in the nation. These are the superheroes of spirituality to Jews at this time. And Jesus says, now out of these three, which one was this man's neighbor? Implied message, out of these three which one is going to live eternally. That's why the lawyer can't say Samaritan. He understands he's been trapped by Jesus. The story is so beautifully wound that the guy can't escape it. I'm questioning Jesus because I really want him to look at me and say, you've done enough. I really want him to say, you have been obedient enough. You have been disciplined enough. You have been pious enough. And so I'm questioning Jesus, putting him on blast, because I think what he's going to do is give me a pat on the back and tell me I'm going to be saved because I am one of the most religious people in this whole crowd. But instead, Jesus doesn't just put him on blast. I love Jesus. Jesus is not trying to expose you. Jesus does not put him on blast and tell everybody what's really on his heart, which would have exposed him in front of the whole entire crowd. But instead, Jesus tells him a story. A story that has him in it. So when he asked this man, out of which of these three was this man's neighbor, He's really saying and asking this man to say that his enemy is in a better position to be saved than he is. That the person he thinks is the furthest away from God, that is the most morally debased, that he's actually in a better position to experience eternal life than he is. Yo, Jesus is an amazing storyteller. And in one small story that probably took Christ all of five minutes to tell, this man is, he is placed in front of this major tension. Is Jesus saying that I'm not going to heaven? And I think we need to consider the question, what does it take? to inherit eternal life. Now, I want you to consider the question because if truth be told and Jesus took the whole heaven thing off the table and there was no heaven, many of us would not be Christians anymore. Heaven is really one of the main reasons we're all sitting here today. So then let's be honest and put the thing that means the most to us on display. What does it really take to experience heaven? I want to show you this text. They're going to have it for you on the screen. James 1 and verse 27. What does it really take to get to heaven, to e inherit eternal life? This lawyer has a problem. Did Jesus just say the people that I think are furthest away from him are actually in a better position to be saved than I am? After all of the religious things that I do every single day of the week, including keeping the Sabbath? Look at this, James chapter 1 and verse 27. It says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means 
caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt us. Now, notice in this list that most of us are only concerned on an everyday basis with the last thing listed in the list. Keeping from being corrupted by the world. How is that working out for us? No, we're still being corrupted by the world. We still have practices in our life that we don't know, want anyone to know about. We still splurge on sin maybe every other weekend just to get the tension out from having to fight our flesh. How is it working when our focus is on the last thing in the list? It hasn't been working out too well for us. The way that this is listed in this text is in an order where the most important things are first, least important being last. It says here, before being corrupted by the world, care for orphans. And then it says, and care for widows. Oh, and keep from being corrupted by the world. Now look at this list. I want you to look at this list and I want you to tell me this. The last thing in the list, can you do it? No, you can't do it. We talk about our favorite verse around here all the time. For it is God that works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. You cannot keep yourself from being corrupted by the world. The Holy Spirit comes into your life. He sanctifi sanctifies it and he transforms you by changing the way you think. That is Romans chapter 12. You can't accomplish the last one, but there are two in this list that you can do. You can care for orphans and you can care for widows. Man, let me show you this other text. It's just going to blow your mind because I think this is a prayer we pray a lot. It is in Isaiah 58, beginning in verse 3. I want them to bring this up. Please follow along very closely. This is the people of Israel talking to God. They ask this question. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves. Man, has anybody prayed this prayer to God? Can we just be honest today? Have you ever looked at God and said, man, I've been doing this. Why aren't you impressed? I've been very hard on myself. I stopped eating this and I stopped going there. And you don't even notice it. I will tell you why. I respond. This is God saying, I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. Verse 4, what good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. Verse 5, you humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance. Penance being another word for religious practices. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of religious practice. Bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Which is the equivalent of us saying we get dressed up in suits and nice dresses before we come to church. And he says, is that what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? Watch verse 6. No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly in prison. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. He ends right here. This is God prophesying over his people in verse 8. It says, then your salvation will come like dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Notice here, he did not say salvation and healing comes from you focusing on being more disciplined, more pious, reading your Sabbath school lesson, praying more often. No, he says it is directly tied to you looking at the needy humans in this world and saying, I want to help you. 
then your salvation will break forth and your wounds will be healed. Many of you guys are like, God, why haven't you healed me yet? And he's saying, yo, you haven't helped anybody yet. The majority of your day is spent in a prayer closet praying for me to clean you. I want to clean you as you help others find cleansing. This is how I work. Man, how have we missed it? It's all through the Bible. Have we not recognized Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34 on to 40 when he says, hey, I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then it says, these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it, to the least of these, you did it unto me. But then it says, he turns to the other group on the other side and says, for I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. God looks at the people who are not saved and he does not list their sins. He lists the fact that they never became humanitarians. And to the ones that are saved, he does not list the sins that they overcame. He lists the people that they helped. How, how, do, how do we miss this? It's right in God's word. Matthew chapter 7. It says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do. That's a big word there. Do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. And we casted out demons in your name. And we performed many miracles in your name. Their list is a list of religious practice. And what does God respond? But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. What if breaking God's law is more about you refusing to help people? Is it not Paul who said the whole law can be summarized like this? Love thy neighbor as yourself? What if keeping the law is not about thou shalt not steal, kill, commit adultery, be covetous and adulterous? What about if it's really about thou shalt not ignore those that need your help? Thou shalt not focus your whole spiritual experience on your own enlightenment. Thou shalt not be overly concerned with your own salvation. What about if we agree with the word of God? It is truly about loving God and loving your neighbor. Jesus says on these two hinge all the writings of the prophets. I look at this text, and I go back to Luke, and the guy asks a great question. What does it take to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him a story that has the most unlikely character being saved. Now, the lawyer in his mind, I know, is listing all the bad things Samaritans do. And he's trying to deal with the tension that I don't know how he can inherit the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't follow the laws. But Jesus' story is indirectly pushing him to accept the fact that one in the story that does not follow the laws is the actual one that goes back to heaven. And maybe it's because all of the laws are really just about you extending to people what Jesus extended to you. For does not John chapter 13 say this? I give you a new commandment that you love one another 
as I have loved you. And then he moves on to say, by this, everyone in the world will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. So me being able to tell if you're a disciple of Christ has nothing to do with how many verses you can quote to me. And it has nothing to do with how many fundamental beliefs are in a bag. It has everything to do with when God points out to you someone in your environment that is desperate and in, in need of his help, that you obey that voice and that you go to them. Here's the major issue for the lawyer. His day is so full of him pursuing being saved, that he does not have time to stop and help. Not only does he not have time, but I want to, I want to close down on this. His religion does not allow him the opportunity to help like this good Samaritan. See, in the parable, we look at the priest and the Levite, and we look down on them because we think they're just being snobbish by passing this guy. Understand, based on the religious right of being a Levite and a priest, you could not touch anything that had an open wound or was a dead carcass. The story is very clear. Jesus says that this man was beaten almost unto death. He's laying there looking like a dead carcass with open wounds. The Levite and the priest are simply obeying the religious law. They are obeying the law of Moses when it comes to how a Levite and a priest should carry themselves. If they were to help this man, that meant that they would have to go through a laborious process of cleansing before they can get their job back. So what God is really asking the priest and the Levite to do when they see this man is I want you to take a position that does not benefit you, that actually causes you more grief, that actually takes a whole lot of time away, that messes up your schedule and your plan, and I actually want you to help this man anyway. This lawyer sees the story and says, but wait, the priest did what he was supposed to do. The Levite did what he was supposed to do, so check this out. Jesus tells this man that it's not the people in the story that did what they were supposed to do that get into the kingdom of heaven. Wow! It's actually the people that are known for not doing what they're supposed to be doing that make it into the kingdom of heaven. Because the priest and the Levite obeyed the law. But their religiosity, their fixation on obedience so that I can get in, actually causes them to miss being saved. Now you understand how people will be standing at the judgment saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things for you? And now you can understand how it's justified when he responds, depart from me. I never knew you, you children of lawlessness. Because the law has always been tied to your ability to sacrifice on the behalf of other humans. Why do we have so Sabbath? We have so Sabbath to keep you grounded enough to recognize where true salvation is. For Isaiah 58 says, it is when people fast like this that salvation will spring forth and that healing will take place. As a musician begins to play, I was so challenged by this revelation of a very familiar story that I never truly understood. I didn't understand what it sounded like to the ear of the Jew. 
And now I see what Jesus was trying to communicate to the whole Jewish system, to the whole religious system. Hey, guys, we missed it. It was never about these rights, rules, and orders. It was always about, I was trying to build a nation that was burdened with helping people. That's what I was trying to do. When I called you blessed, it was because I wanted to bless you so you could help people. When I said that you would be the head and not the tail, it was because I wanted you to go help people. When I said that you would be lenders and not borrowers, it was because I wanted you to go help people. When I said that you would never have a lot lack, that the righteous have never been seen forsaken, nor their seed begging bread, it was because I needed you to have bread enough to share with somebody else. I'm trying to get a people group here on this planet to stop being so focused on their own salvation that they walk past all of the millions and billions of people who are lost on this planet. And you know what? Jesus can hold us that accountable. Why can't it? Because in the book Desire of Ages, page 503, this is what it says. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus gave a picture of himself and his mission. I ask you the question. In the Good Samaritan, which of those three represent Jesus? It is the rejected person. It is the person that if he walked around in Jerusalem, he would get spit on and even beaten down. Did that not happen to Jesus? Does not the word say he is the stone that the builders rejected? He is the person that the Jews rejected. The people that I called to bless this planet ended up being the same people that killed me. Christ is the good Samaritan. He's the one that found you in a ditch dead in your immorality. He is the one that knew you didn't even have the strength to walk anymore. So the word says that he put you up on his transportation and he decided to walk. He's the one that took you to a place where you could be cared for. But check this out. Even if humanity found a way back to the hospital, you don't have no insurance. You can't afford it. So that's when he put some money on the table. And he said, listen, I'm going to make provision for them. And if the bill runs higher than this, I will be back to repay. Jesus can hold you accountable to this standard because he did it himself. He was benefited by no way, shape, or form by coming to this planet and saving you and me. He gains nothing. He was the son of God before he came. Did he get a promotion? No, he's still the son of God. He was God before he came. Is there anything higher than God? No, he's still God. He had all power before he came. He went back, still has all power. He gained nothing. And so what we see in Jesus Christ is a God that loves you so much that he would put everything on the line just so you could have a shot at inheriting eternal life. Jesus is the good Samaritan. And so he says to his people, is a servant greater than the master? Or is a student greater than the teacher? I say no. What you have seen me do, you must do also. Why do we have so Sabbath? Because we believe this is how we keep the law. We help people that need our help. God, I'm praying in the name of Jesus right now that you would Accept the repentant hearts in the building. God, I rebuke any heart in this moment that is still trying to fathom how they can earn their way to salvation. 
I rebuke any spirit that's trying to convict anyone in here that there is still laws to be kept. There are still things that must be done. God, I come against any spirit that would try to take away this moment of recognizing that our whole existence as Christians on this planet is tied into how we help people in need. And God, we apologize for being so busy that we have even told you, I don't have the time to do it. I don't have the time to stop and help this person. I don't have the time to pick up this phone and listen to this other person ramble on for hours about their problems. I don't have time. I don't even have the resources to take money out of my pocket and give it to a beggar. I don't have time to volunteer at some organization. I don't even have time to make sure my own family feels the love of Jesus Christ through my self-sacrifice. I just don't have time. God, your word is ringing true in my ear and I believe in this building. Which one of these three? This man's neighbor. Your word says, it is the one who showed mercy. God, give us your gift of mercy. It's one of your fruits of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes in, He brings mercy, God, and we need that. We have no mercy. God, we are so focused on self. We are selfish even when we think we're being unselfish, God. This is how twisted our psyche is, and there's no one that can save us from this body of death than Jesus Christ. So please come on the inside and cause a complete transformation to where our number one priority exists with what can I do for people? In the name of Jesus, I pray this. Amen. As this song is being sung, I just want everyone to rest in this moment. A lot of times we move on to the next thing in the schedule. And it doesn't have time to sink in deep and root into your life. I believe God is trying to actually change the entire worldview of individuals here who are willing to accept it. Our praise and worship leader is just going to sing this song. And I want you to agree with the lyrics. And I want you to internalize this message. And I want you to make your own personal commitment to God that your time will not be about you anymore but that your entire existence will be about other people who need help. You're praying in your heart for this type of transformation. 